Hi guys, Dane here, and welcome to part number whatever it is of my bookshelf tour series. So today I'm going to be carrying on from where I left off. So in the last one, I went through my Graham Green books. So we're going to pick up from Gr and go to Ha, I guess. Without further ado, let's go. All right, first book here we have The Brothers Grimm, Grimm's Fairy Tales, and this is a little children's classics edition of it. I'm sure it's not their, you know, full collection. In fact, this has my ex-girlfriend's brother's name in it, so I guess we know where this came from. <laughs> but um, yeah, some of the some of the like pretty well-known ones here. We've got uh, Tom Thumb, Hansel and Gretel, Rumpelstiltskin. Everyone's got to read some Brothers Grimm at some point, really. I think just to see the difference between like fairy tales and popular culture, and the initial brutality of their fairy tales, you know. Okay. Then we have Josh Grogan, Marley and Me. Yeah, I uh, I don't know where I got this from. I have a feeling it was another freebie or maybe I got it for like 50p from a charity shop or something. Did actually really enjoy this. I've seen the movie as well, but the movie wasn't as good as the book. I didn't cry though, because I am made of stone. And because books rarely make me cry. The only time I've ever cried at a book is at the end of The Amber Spyglass by Philip Pullman. That that ending was cruel. It, I don't, it was just cruel. All right, here we have some Choose. This is by John Lehman and Rob Guillory. This is the Omnivore Edition, Volume 1. But I have a feeling this is like issues 1 to 10 or something. And um, this is basically about this guy, Tony Chu, who is cyberpathic, which means he can kind of read minds of things by eating them. So uh, beets are the only thing he doesn't get psychic impressions from. Anything else, say milk, he'll remember the cow and so he ends up getting a job as like a homicide detective because obviously he can bite a dead body like chew somebody's thumb like he's doing here there's a finger he's got on his plate and he can chew that and then he gets this psychic impression and can kind of tell how they died so this is the omnivore edition volume one this is the omnivore edition volume two yes yeah, so this is uh, this collects just desserts and flambe this one and then we have here because at this point when i was reading them they didn't have any more of these omnivore editions so i had uh Major League Chew, which is 21 to 25, and Space Cakes, volumes 26 to volumes 30. And I'm pretty sure that more of these are now out, so I really need to uh, need to go and read those. All right, here we have Bound for Glory by Woody Guthrie. This is literally Woody Guthrie's autobiography. Uh, funnily enough, I picked this up because Bob Dylan mentioned it a lot in his Chronicles, volume 1, which is his autobiography. And so... Um, because it had been such like a formative book for Dylan, I, I picked it up myself. And it was very good. Definitely recommend it if you're a fan of Woody Guthrie. If you don't know who he is, you probably won't enjoy it as much. Okay, here we have Sagard the Barbarian game book. Number one, The Ice Dragon by Gary Gygax and Flint Dill. Now, Gary Gygax is the inventor of Dungeons and Dragons. And this game book is basically like a choose-your-own-adventure, but it also includes combat in there so you have uh, enemies have a certain amount of health for example if you die you have to begin the book again and um, you can either play this with a, uh, a d4 with a four-sided dice or if you see here on the corners of the pages this is so cool what you do is like you flip so there I rolled a three and uh, I had a lot of good times with this book when I was a kid I really enjoyed it I, I might actually check out the rest of these books at some point because I think there's a whole series of them so yeah. Okay, then we have The Raft by Leopold Haas. And this is published by Reality Street, who are kind of like a, uh, an experimental poetry publisher. If you look here, you can see like the layout of it. It's pretty crazy. I used to be a Reality Street supporter, which meant I played, paid a certain amount a year and got some free books out of them. Um, yeah, this is pretty forgettable, to be honest. I wouldn't recommend it. It's only interesting if, I guess, if you yourself are a poet and you want to see who's pushing the boundaries, you know? Uh, it's not for the casual reader at all. Okay, here we have Celia Haddon, Cats Behaving Badly. Why cats do the funny things they do. And this is just a book that I got when we got Biggie Cobain. And it's basically a big long list of different questions and tips about, uh, you know, different different stages of cats' uh, lives as well as their behaviour as well. And I seem to recall this being pretty good. Alright, now we have Mark Haddon. So this is A Spot of Bother. And... Um, I really, I really remember this one, actually, now reading the blurb. So, at 57, George is settling down to a comfortable retirement, building a shed in his garden, reading historical novels, listening to a bit of light jazz. Then Katie, his unpredictable daughter, announces that she is getting remarried to Ray, 
And it's basically... Uh, oh, yeah. Unnoticed in the uproar, George discovers a sinister lesion on his hip and quietly begins to lose his mind. So, you know, he thinks he's got cancer or whatever and he doesn't want to doesn't wanna see a doctor about it. Uh, I would recommend this, actually, if you've read Charles Heathcote's books, the Doris books, because it's similar in that it's like a cantankerous old person as the main character. Here we have Mark Haddon's most famous book, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. And this was huge here in the UK when I was about maybe 15, 16 or something like that. So people my age tend to have, have kind of pretty cool memories of it, I think. And uh, yeah, I read this at, at the time and really enjoyed it. Still own me copy. And as you can see, it's made me want to read more Mark Haddon. So here we have The Red House. This is very similar to, I guess, to the, the style of the others in, in terms of it's about a family, you know? Family is at the heart of it. And in this one, they all live in this red house. And uh, yeah. All right, here we have Sylvia Hadfield, Amsterdam Lessons. So this is a personalized erotica novel in which I am a character. I believe I had a threesome. Let me flick in. Oh, it used the word quim. It used the word quim, quim alert. This is one of my most hated things in erotica. All right, Jesus. Whilst Dane began stroking the backs of her knees, one of her most sensitive spots, Adrian had come onto the bed cupping her magnificent breasts and toying with her aroused, extended nipples. In response, Emily let out a little moan of pleasure. Dane's hands encircled each of her legs as he gently rubbed his thumbs up and down the front of her thighs, the four fingers of each hand tracing their way along the muscles at the back. Emily could feel her skin puckering into goosebumps of sensual pleasure as he moved his hands around. People are walking past my window. His thumbs now rested on the outer thigh, his fingers on her inner thigh. Moving up and down the inside of her thighs, his fingers circled and fell, only to rise again to the fleshy tops, the guardians to the gate of her quim. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's like a guitar. He pushed his tongue into her warm and welcoming mouth as Adri strummed at her clip. She's fingering the G-string. I hope she's not A minor. <laughs> oh dear, that was a paedophilia joke. All right, uh, moving on. The Flying Sorcerer's More Comic Tales of Fantasy by Terry Pratchett, Roald Dahl, and many others. Edited by Peter Haining. And yeah, this is, uh, oh, it also has Kurt Vonnegut Jr., Roald Dahl, Arthur C. Clarke, Michael Moorcock, Angela Carter, and even P.G. Woodhouse and C.S. Lewis. So uh, yeah, if you're into comic fantasy, Check it out. And comic fantasy is very much like if you think of what the disc world is. Or like, if you, I guess you would call like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is like comic sci-fi. So comic fantasy is anything humorous uh, that uses fantasy. Here we have Lee Hall, Dark Blood. Uh, I don't remember this one, I'm afraid. This is one that I was sent for a review. I think it's a thriller. It's a fairly generic thriller, I believe. All right, here we have Willis Hall, The Last Vampire. And I have super fond memories of this book. Oh, it's wet for some reason. Why is it wet? Why are all of these wet? I like this because it's about Count Alucard. Uh, and obviously Alucard, spelled backwards, is Dracula. But Count Alucard is also a, uh, he's a vegetarian vampire. So you can imagine why that appealed to me, even as a child. I mean, I wanted to be vegetarian for years before I went vegetarian, and I turned veggie at about 15, so I guess that's an early indicator. Here we have Inbound Marketing by Brian Halligan and Dharmesh Shah. These are the two co-founders of a company called Hub HubSpot, which you might have heard of if you're into marketing at all. Sp uh, the subtitle is Get Found Using Google, Social Media and Blogs. Basically, the whole idea is instead of going out in front of people with advertisements, you should create content that they actively want to consume. And actually, if you are a booktuber, you who are watching this, then you're kind of already doing that. If that makes sense, you, you, you know, you're not running adverts in front of people. You're putting out your reviews and your wrap ups and people are coming to you, you know. And then here we have Who Killed Kurt Cobain by Ian Halperin and Max, Max Wallace. The Mysterious Death of an Icon. Now... I've talked about this somewhere else, weirdly, at some point. I can't remember where, but, uh, yeah, I don't think that there was a big... I don't think somebody killed Kurt Cobain. A lot of people, especially big Nirvana fans, like to think that Courtney Love did it, and they all hate Courtney Love. But I have no problem with her, and I don't think she killed him. I think, at worst, what might have happened is he might have took an accidental overdose, and then somebody made it look like he shot himself afterwards. But I don't think it was murder. 
Anyway, speaking of murder, we have Dashiell Hammett, Woman in the Dark, a novel of dangerous romance. And Dashiell Hammett is famous for creating Sam Spade. This is the only Hammett I've read so far, but I do really want to read some more of his at some point because he's one of those. He's like, he is the, uh, you know, the Agatha Christie of hard-boiled crime novels, basically. Here we have Richard Hammond, On the Edge, My Story. And he co-wrote this with uh, Mindy Hammond, his wife, who I believe, like... I mean, to be fair, he's a journalist, and, uh, yeah, she's written a few novels that have never been published. But, um, so, you know, they've got some writing ability between them, I guess. And this largely follows what happened around the big crash he had where he almost killed himself trying to set a land speed record or something. I don't know what he was doing. Yeah, it's all right. It's what you expect from a celebrity memoir, really. Here we have Jack Handy, Deep Thoughts, and Jack Handy, Deepest Thoughts. So he used to be a writer for Saturday Night Live. And uh, I saw Time for Books on her channel recently. She was talking about a Jack Handy book, which, which, which wasn't one of these. So the Deep Thoughts, I'll read you a few. If you lived in the Dark Ages and you were a catapult operator, I bet the most common question people would ask is, can't you make it shoot farther? No, I'm sorry. That's as far as it shoots. When you go for a job interview, I think a good thing to ask is if they ever press charges. How come the dove gets to be the peace symbol? How about the pillow? It has more feathers than the dove, and it doesn't have that dangerous beak. Of all the warning sounds that animals make, I think the one that's the least effective on me is a kind of clicking noise. Whether they ever find life there or not, I think Jupiter should be considered as an enemy planet. Yeah, definitely recommend these, they made me laugh a lot. Whenever someone asks me to define love, I usually think for a minute, then I spin around and pin the guy's arm behind his back. Now who's asking the questions? Okay, then we have Exploration by Shug Hanlon. This is something that the author sent me. Unfortunately, I didn't like it very much. I don't even know how I would describe it. I guess sort of like a bad, fairly badly written music memoir. Okay, then we have my collection of David Hare plays, which includes Skylight, Amy's View, The Judas Kiss, and My Zinc Bed. Now, basically, I got kind of obsessed with this because of a, a TV, like a made-for-TV movie version of the play My Zinc Bed, uh, starring Paddy Considine and Uma Thurman. They were both in it. And I think Jonathan Price was the third person in it. And it was really very good about uh, alcoholism, basically. And I loved it so much that I had to read the actual play, the source material. Never seen it performed, though. I'd like to. Okay, here we have my Roger Hargreaves books. So we have Little Miss Bad. Mr. Bump, which my mum always used to call me, and Mr. Tickle. And these are just Mr. Men and Little Miss books that I've picked up throughout the years. I used to have way more when I was a kid, but I can't remember which ones. Here we have Light and Dark, 21 Short Stories by C.J. Harris. This is like a, an indie or self-published collection of short stories. But I do actually remember that one as being alright, you know. Um, probably not my favourite short story collection ever, but it was fine. Here we have Oblivion by Pamelise Harris, so this is written by my editor, so Pam is the editor for my novels, and this is all set in New York City and is basically about like an acting troupe at High Garden Academy, home of New York's most prestigious actors. Uh, it wasn't really my thing to be honest, and actually it could have done with better formatting I, th I felt, but... It, you know, it was alright. Alright, and then we have Thomas Harris, and so this is Hannibal, we have Hannibal Rising, and then here is Red Dragon and the Silence of the Lambs bound up in one. Two bestsellers in one volume. And yeah, I read all of these when I was a teenager and uh, really enjoyed them. I've actually recently picked up as well another of his books called like called Black Sunday. There we go. Which I didn't even, I thought he'd only written the Hannibal books for some reason. I'm sure I looked into it and that was all I could find. But um, yeah, I really enjoyed Thomas Harris's stuff and, you know, if you... He's basically like... I feel like he's a, like a good version of Dan Brown almost. Not that Dan Brown's bad, because I know people read his books. He gets a lot of flack. I, I described him as the Nickelback of literature once, and I think that's pretty accurate. So, uh, I mean, I've read Dan Brown's books. They're up there somewhere. You can probably see him. Yeah. Third to third shelf over at the end. I mean, I've already done the tour for that shelf, so you can check it out if you want. But uh, anyway, on that note, that is it for this edition of the Bookshelf Tour. So, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books. Hit subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video, including, at some point, the next part of the Bookshelf Tour, which is actually on to my fourth bookshelves, which are like half width or a third width, so I'll actually be doing like three shelves at once. And we'll be going through the H's. So we're doing good. We made a good dent.
All right. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.